If you would get ready, we're going to start off with congregational song. I'll be right back. Well, wasn't that some good food? It's good. If you're full, say amen. All right, God. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a program here, let it settle, and then you can go back for thirds, okay? How's that sound? Grab your song sheet there, and we're going to sing together, God, Give Us Christian Homes. Amen? We'll sing God, Give Us Christian Homes. It's somewhat, somewhat of a new song to us, so uh, we'll do the best we can. Give us Christian homes, homes where the Bible is loved and taught, homes where the Master's will is sought, homes crowned with beauty your love has wrought. God, give us Christian homes, God, give us Christian homes. God, give us Christian homes. Homes where the Father is true and strong. Homes that are free from lie of wrong. Homes that are joyous with love and song. God, give us Christian homes. God, give us Christian homes. On the third, God, give us Christian homes. Homes where the mother in caring quest strives to show others your way is best. Homes where the Lord is an honored guest. God, give us Christian homes. God, give us Christian homes. On the last, God, give us Christian homes. Homes where the children are led to in his beauty who loves them so homes where the altar fires burn and glow God give us Christian homes God give us Christian homes Amen, wonderful singing that's a great song let's pray together And we'll ask the Lord for his blessing on this Father in heaven. Uh, We just ask you now to help us to uh, be alert and to just uh, absorb uh, what you have for us tonight. Uh, Give us spiritual ears uh, that we may hear. Bless this uh, fun time that we have now for the next few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Brother Luke, come on up and do what you're going to do.
Hey, Steve. How's it going? Oh, hey, Brad. How you doing, buddy? Oh, good. What a day it's been. Tell me about it. Oh, these employee reviews. Just, it seems like we have to do these all the time. I hate employee reviews. It's like, what good is it? I know. We, we tell them how bad they are all the time. We got to tell don't get them any better. Year just how bad it is. Well, it could be worse. could be at home oh. you know, getting told to take out the trash, you know. Sweep the floor. Yeah, oh, Man. take out the trash. Let me ask you a question. Does your wife ask you to take out the trash and then five hours later when you come back to take out the trash, she's already done it? Uh, of course, yeah, all the time. Happens every time. I mean, if she's gonna take out the trash 30 seconds after she asks you, why doesn't she just do it herself without asking? Right, I told so, her I would do what I do. Oh, that's stress in our life. I that's, that's for sure. Pick up the clothes off the floor, put them in the hamper. Oh man, I could go on about it all day. Over but and over. We really probably should get back to work here yeah, and get this stuff done. <laughs> Hey guys. Oh, hey Luke. Hey Luke, how you doing? I'm great, I'm great. Here, are you guys going to that uh, marriage conference next week? Oh, the one over at Southeast Bible Baptist Church? Yeah, that oh, one. Oh yeah, that one. Should be great. Yeah, we, we go to all their events. I mean, there's nothing going on in our church ever. Man, yeah. I cannot wait to get married. What an incredible and joyous experience that will be. Like, heaven on earth. Oh, you said it Luke, heaven on earth. That's, that you got it exactly right. You know, speaking of marriage, um, Brittany and I have been like getting in a lot of petty arguments lately, and I was just wondering if I could pick you guys' brains for some advice. Yeah, yeah, sure, Luke. We'll shoot you straight. Of course. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Great. So, like, do you guys fight about little things once you get married? <laughs> Luke, Luke, Luke. Look, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Once you get married, all the fighting, it, it just stops. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> what he said, yeah. Yeah, you, you never fight about petty little things like whose turn it is to put the kids to bed or why she's always buying coffee when you can just make it at home. Oh, yeah, and, and there's, there's like no more begging for forgiveness over all the little things. You know, one simple little thing, honest mistakes like, you know, leaving the toilet seat up or you know, putting the toilet paper where she likes it, you know, underneath, coming from underneath. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I don't, I don't get it. So when does it like suddenly change? Well, it, it's hard to explain, Brother Luke. It's, it, it's kind of like magic. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like a fairy tale, Luke. Marriage is just, it's this incredible and wonderful state of life. Like, I don't know, maybe it's the realization that you're going to be with this one person for the rest of your life. Yeah. It really yeah. frees you up. Wow, this is awesome. Like, okay, so, so tell me more, what else happens? Well, once you're married, your wife will no longer feel the need to constantly remind you how to drive. Like, when it's best to begin slowing down or what the best parking spot is at church. It, yeah, it's like she's not even there riding with you. It's awesome. Oh man, I can't wait for that because I feel like my girlfriend and I were just arguing about that like today. Anyways, uh, what else do you guys have for me? Well, you know, one of my favorite things is when you get married, you start to lose weight. <laughs> well, is, is that what that scone told you? Oh, what are you because, talking about? Or cannoli, whatever that is. <laughs> Because, honestly, you guys are looking a little fatter. Brad, what? This is 100% muscle. Exactly. Bodies like these don't come easy. <sighs> Could have fooled me. But anyways, this is great. Keep going. Look, Tell me more. Look, when you're married, you just always want to look your best. Really? Oh, yeah. And you know another great thing is that you just, well, I'm not sure you're ready for this, but when you get married, Immediately, you just start making out all the time. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, her, and her breath will never smell bad. Just, Brother Luke, you just won't even believe it. Just get ready for some spontaneous make-out sessions. That will be awesome. I cannot wait for that part. Oh, yeah, and, and another thing that's great about marriage is it, you don't realize how much fun and romantic it is to talk about money. Yeah. Really? It's phenomenal. Because 
I swear my girlfriend and I almost got in a fist fight the other day talking about our budget. Well, you, you know what they say, Luke. Marriage, it, it just eradicates defensiveness. Y yeah, and, and I would say that, and, and criticism too, right, Brad? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah once, once you're married, you, you never have even had the desire to make fun of your wife about anything. She, she just does everything right. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to your male friends sometimes when you tell them, but it's just because your wife is perfect. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I mean, it's true. You know, once you're married, it just frees you. It frees you from thoughts of ever wanting to be single ever again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It, it, it plus, 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 I just thought of this bonus. You won't realize how much fun it is to be with your wife's family. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, seriously, I mean, it's, it's almost scary how much I look forward to, to the holiday times and, and being at my in-laws. And I love my wife's mother. <laughs> seriously? Because I, I hope you're right, because Brittany's mother, <laughs> she can be... I get it, Luke. Let it out. <laughs> Let it out. <laughs> She can be a real pain. Yeah. I mean, a real pain. And don't even get me started on her dad. <laughs> well, Oy. and speaking of mother-in-law, let me tell you this. On the wedding day itself, all those problems, the desire to control everything, your, your mother-in-law constantly demanding that things be done a certain way, that just goes right away on the wedding day. 100% gone. Poof. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and, and once you're married, this is the best thing. Like, your wife won't even care about things like Valentine's Day or, like, especially birthdays. I mean, you never have to buy flowers or presents or, or anything. I mean, sometimes I won't even remember when her birthday is, and, and she doesn't even care. It's, it's truly like magic. Luke, listen. Marriage, in one word, it's just dreamy. He's, he's absolutely right. Well, guys, seriously, thank you so much. Like, oh, hold on. Ring, ring. <laughs> this, this is her now. Um, I gotta take, oh wait. Once we get married, will she still call me this many times a day? Nah. nah. Okay, all right, great. Well, I can't wait for marriage. Thanks, guys. All right, see you later. No problem, Luke. We gotta get back to these things. Yeah. Hey, hey Brad? Yeah? I, I kind of feel bad. You think we should tell him the truth? No, nobody ever told me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Here you go, pass them around. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, now. We're going to have a contest here, Battle of the Genders, okay? And we need five couples, five couples to come up here and be a part of going head-to-head -head in some family feud, all right? So, hey, the winning team, each person gets a $25 Amazon gift card, all right? I need, to, I need five, five couples. Come on up, first come, first serve. Who wants to do it? I'm just going to have some marriage trivia here. It's not personal, it's just something that they asked a crowd of 100 people. <clears throat> who wants to know, who wants to play? Five couples. All right, Greg and Becky, come on down. All right, Steve and Jackie, so uh, guys on this side, girls on this side, just make sure you coincide with your spouse. All right, so we got one. All right. Are we good? Yeah. All right, Corey, over there. Very good. All right, Brother Luke, you're in charge of this. All right, All right you got it? Yes, sir. Oh, this should be good. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome 
to Family Emphasis Feud, everyone. All right, I'm your man, Luke Tulloch, all right? <laughs> we got a good one for you today. Ladies versus gentlemen, it's going to be great. Husband versus wife, you know, what better way to promote peace and tranquility in the home? All right, so that's what we're trying to do tonight. Okay, and like Pastor said, there's five cards here, $25 Amazon gift cards for the winning, for the gen- I mean the winning side, all right? Okay, so let me get this turned on. And um, what we're going to do, make sure they work. All right. So, Brother and Mrs. Seneca, you're first. You actually have to come up here. They're not. They're not. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, you don't, have to, you don't have to look at me. You can face each other. I did. I just tested them. They're good. You want to try it and make sure it works? All right. How about you? Okay. We're good. Okay. So here's how this works. I'm going to ask a question. Whoever buzzes first gets to answer, okay? And then there's going to be five answers on the wall, or five blanks on the wall. Whoever gets the highest one will get to play or pass, all right? Okay, so the faster you push it, the better. You ready? Okay, top five answers on the board. We asked 100 married couples, what is the most important thing to consider when planning a date? Mrs. Seneca. The cost, that's the number three answer. The cost, there you go. All right, so Brother Seneca. Where your wife wants to go. That's the number four answer. What? That's the number four answer, all right? So Mrs. Seneca, would you like to play with the rest of your team or pass? Okay, all right, ladies are gonna play. You can, you can sit down now, you're good. Okay, so same question. Going to Mrs. Brown. Yes. What is the most important thing to consider when planning a date? And you can see the answers on the board if you need to uh, see what's already been said. Babysitter. Babysitter is the number two answer. Number two answer. If I did this, it would be the number one answer. All right. Okay. Mrs. Adams. What is the most important thing to consider when planning a date? What to wear. That is the first incorrect answer. Not in the top five, I'm sorry. (laughs) All right, so that's one X. That's one X. All right, Brittany, you ready? All right, what is the most important thing to consider when planning a date? Uh, The travel. I don't think that's on there. Sorry. It's not on there. That's two X's, okay. It comes down to this. There's two X's. You got to be careful, all right? The guys can steal. They can steal. They can converse amongst themselves, all right? They can steal. Here we go. What is the most important thing to consider when planning a date? This is the way to a man's heart. The food. The food is the number five answer. So there is one more answer. Left on the board, back to you, Mrs. Seneca. What is the most important thing to consider when planning a date? Who you go with? Who you go with? Who you go with? That is incorrect. All right. Who you go with? Okay, so you guys have a chance to steal. All right. If you get it right, you get all the points available. So, what was the question again? What is the most important thing to consider when planning a date? Top answer still on the board. What time? What time is the number one answer? What time is the number one answer? So that's 100 points for the guys, all right? Okay, so now I need Brother Mrs. Brown to come up here. All right, here we go. 
Question number two. <laughs> you ready? All right. Top five answers are on the board. We asked 100 married couples, what might a husband do for his wife to apologize? Brother Brown. Bring her flowers. Bring her flowers is the number two answer. Number two lot. answer. I've done a lot. Mrs. Brown, what do you think? What might a husband do for his wife to apologize? Candy. Candy. <sighs> All right. This one's hard. Hold on. I'm going to talk to somebody real quick. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. All right. We made a decision. That is incorrect. That's not even on the board. <laughs> it's not on the board. Okay, you guys want to play? We are going to pass. All right, gentlemen are passing. Okay. So, all right, so we're at Mrs. Adams. What might a husband do to apologize to his wife? Leave. <laughs> That was worth the X. She said leave. <laughs> she said leave. <laughs> okay. That is incorrect. <laughs> All right. Brittany, what might a husband do for his wife to apologize? House chores. House chores. That is the number three answer. Clean, clean something. There you go. All right. One X, what might a husband do for his wife to apologize? Make dinner. Make dinner is the number five answer. All right, doing good. Two answers left on the board, only one X. Back to you, Mrs. Seneca. What might a husband do for his wife to apologize? Kiss and make up. Um, that's, it's not on there. It's not on there. It's too easy. <laughs> right, right. Yes. So that's the second X. All right, you have two X's. You got to be careful, Mrs. Brown. All right, here we go. What might a husband do for his wife to apologize? Buy her jewelry. <laughs> she said, buy her jewelry. All right. Give a gift. That's the number one answer. All right. Number one answer. Two X's, one answer left on the board. So if you need to see what we got, all right, here we go. What might a husband do for his wife to apologize? Mrs. Adams. I have no idea. I mean, I guess one. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> yes. Apologize. That is incorrect. It's too simple. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, you can steal. That's three X's. All right. There's one answer left. <laughs> what might a husband do for his wife to apologize, gentlemen? Take her out to eat. <laughs> Final answer is rub her feet. All right. All right. So, ladies, yeah, 10 people said it. So you got to yell at those 10 people. You got to find them. All right. <laughs> okay, ladies, that's 90 points. Next, next uh, couple, brother Mrs. Adams, come on up. All right. You ready? All right, here we go. Top five answers on the board. We asked 100 married couples, name something a woman might change that her husband might not notice. <laughs> Mrs. Adams. The dishes. The dishes. That's, that's not on there. <laughs> that's not on there. All right, Brother Adams, what do you think? Name something a woman might change that her husband might not notice. 
Hairstyle's the number one answer. So would you guys like to play and figure out the other four or pass? All right, they're going to play. Gentlemen are going to do this. All right, here we go. You ready? All right, name something a woman might change that her husband might not notice. Hair has already been mentioned. Laundry. The laundry. That is incorrect. That is incorrect. Okay. All right. Brother Statuettes. Name something that a woman might change that her husband might not notice. Home decor. Number four answer is furniture. All right. That'll take, that'll work. Home decor. All right. Back to you, Brother Seneca. There's one X. Name something a woman might change that her husband might not notice. Makeup. Makeup is number two answer. Yeah. All right, number two answer. There we go. Only one X. Ready? Brother Brown, name something a woman might change that her husband might not notice. A child's diaper. <laughs> He's been waiting for that one. <laughs> Am I right, Brittany? <laughs> okay. Brother Adams, back to you. There is two X's, you've got to be careful, the ladies can steal. Name something a woman might change that her husband might not notice. Nail polish. Nail polish is number three answer. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Two X's, you've got to be careful, or the ladies can steal. All right, so can you see the board? Okay, so hair. Is the number one answer, makeup, number two answer, nails, number three answer, furniture, number four answer, and the fifth answer is still there, okay? All right, you ready? Name something a woman might change that her husband might not notice. Clothing, attire. Her clothing. That is incorrect. That was probably the number six answer. All right, so let's see, let's see what the fifth answer was. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> I was trying not to give him the points. All right, ladies, you can steal. Number five answer is on the board for, for like five seconds. Name something a woman might change that her husband might not notice. <laughs> All right, time's up. You ready? What do you got? That's not my turn, is it? Oh, is that what you want to say? Jewelry. Jewelry? Okay, jewelry. We're going with jewelry. That is incorrect. Number five answer was perfume. Perfume. All right. <laughs> they, they would all notice. That's why they didn't know. Okay, all right, guys have 195. All right, you ready? Next couple. Come on right up here. Okay, you ready for this? All right, top five answers are on the board. We asked 100 married couples, name something a spouse might do to show their love. Yes, sir. Give a hug to her affection. There you go, hug or kiss, number two answer. Good job, you can go sit down, great job. All right, so do you wanna play or do you, do you guys wanna play this or pass? Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm on the guy's side. <laughs> You're right. So that's the number two answer. You do, if you can get the number one answer, you guys can play. So name something a spouse might do to show their love. Go on a date. That is not on here. All right. So, guys, do you want to play or pass? All right. They're passing. They are passing, ladies. All right. So, Mrs. Statuettes, name something a spouse might do to show their love. Buy gifts. Give a gift is number three answer. There you go. All right. Mrs. Seneca, name something a spouse might do to show their love. Help out around the house. Do a chore, number four answer. On a roll now. 
Mrs. Brown, name something a spouse might do to show their love. Pastor said she wouldn't know. <laughs> Shoulder, rub. Shoulder rub. That is incorrect. All right. That's the first X, I believe. Okay. Mrs. Adams, name something a spouse might do to show their love. Uh, take me shopping. Take her shopping. That is not on the list. That's the second X. All right. You ready? write a song all right that's number five answer she said write a song I'm gonna take that all right I'm gonna take that write a song it's a good guy over here <laughs> okay there's two X's one answer left mrs. statuettes number one answer is still available name something a spouse might do to show their love give her flowers that is the number one answer. That is the number one answer. Huh? It's anything with giving flowers. You can pick them. You can get them from a cemetery. Whatever. All right? Okay. Yes, sir. Second to last one, I think. All right. Here we go. Brother and Mrs. Statuettes. This is it right here. It's a close game. The men are winning by five points. Okay. Top five answers are on the board. We asked 100 married couples. Name something you and your spouse might share on a... Uh, dessert is the number one answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> pass or play? You're going to play. All right, ladies are going to play. Here we go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Mrs. Seneca, name something you and your spouse might share on a date. An appetizer. Okay. <sighs> you know what? Snacks. That goes. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. That's number four answer. Snacks. <laughs> I guess an appetizer is a snack. All right. Mrs. Brown, name something you and your spouse might share on a date. Our drink? Nope. One X. All right, name something you and your spouse might share on a date. Fork? A fork. <laughs> that is not on the list. <laughs> All right. Brittany, name something you and your spouse might share on a date. A napkin? That is incorrect. Okay, guys. There's a lot of answers on the board. Name something you and your spouse might share on a date. Do we get the same consideration from them if we get part of it? <laughs> um, affection. That's the number three answer. Yeah. Number three answer. All right. So guys get the points. The other answers available were uh, your dinner or the main course. Um, and then number five was stories. Share stories, okay? So, pastor didn't put the final score, but the guys won. All right? So, good job, gentlemen. Make sure you share those with your wife.
Testing one, two. So, my wife and I are going to sing a song for you. And now right after that, Brother Royalty is going to come up. And uh, Brother Royalty has been a blessing to me, his family, their testimony. Um, when, when I came back from Humphrey, I don't know if I told any of you this, but um, when we came back to Heritage, he actually was the pastor that followed me down there, and he pastored that church for a while. And in addition to that, we've had the opportunity to get to, get to know each other at the camp, uh, to uh, watch their family, and uh, it's just been a blessing. So when I was at the legal seminar in Ohio this last fall, his father preached, and his father was a pastor for many years, and it was just a blessing to me as I sat there, and in my heart I was going over what, what I wanted to do in 2024, just praying for the Lord's guidance and I just, the Lord just laid on my ha- heart his family and just the legacy that, uh, uh, that they have and that he has embraced the faith of his father. And now he and his wife endeavor to pass on their faith to their children and, and just to see them serving the Lord. It's been a blessing to me and an encouragement. And I've always enjoyed his preaching. I always felt it to be balanced and to be just um, biblical. And so I'm looking forward to hearing what he and his wife both have laid on their heart this weekend. But tonight, after we're done singing, Brother Royalty is going to come preach to you. Do your best to stay awake. No, I don't think you'll have a problem. Grab a quick cup of coffee if you need to. All right. night we will face it together through the good times I'll be there clinging warmly to your hand when there's no one else to care I'll be there to understand Yours forever, only yours. I'll be yours forever. Yours forever, only yours. God has brought us together. On the wings of love you came. Taught me how to fly through the years, it will be the same. I'll be yours forever. As our love blossoms sweeter, there's a place inside my heart I know only you can fill. Until death will never part, you're the keeper of my heart. Yours for. How to fly 
through the years it will be the same I'll be yours forever and ever I'll be yours Well, here we are. It's good to see each of you tonight. Thank you for all the kind hospitality. And uh, are we okay? Am I echoing? Is that just me? Put it down a little bit. Way down here. (laughs) All right. Well, it's good to see everybody tonight. Wasn't that a delicious meal? What a blessing that was. And I appreciate all the hard work of everybody who was a part of that. And... um, I'll just give a quick background here to myself, my wife. I don't know most of you, and I'm assuming most of you don't know us, and so I'll just tell you quickly, uh, but uh, Pastor Cellini gave a little bit of background. My dad was a pastor down in the Youngstown, Ohio area for 40 years, and I had the privilege of serving with him on staff there for 12 years after we graduated from college and we got married, and uh, if you would have told us when we got married what God had in store for our lives, we would have said, you're crazy. Uh, but God has given us six children, which we're very grateful for. Um, I won't go through all of them. You'll meet most of them this weekend here. Two are still in college, and so we're uh, praying that they'll make it through. Um, But God has allowed us to be in the Cleveland, Ohio area for the last 12 years, pastoring Broadview Heights Baptist Church there in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm very thankful for every step that the Lord has led us on. Our life has just been one of steps. We, we don't have anything planned out. We don't know what God has, but we know the steps that God orders in our lives are His plan, and we're thankful for that. I hope you get to meet my wife. Uh, you'll get to see her around, I'm sure, tomorrow. I want to encourage you to be a part of this whole weekend, um, what the Lord is doing. I appreciate Pastor Cellini and Mrs. Cellini's burden and vision for families. And uh, none of us are where we ought to be. I'm thankful that we're all not where we used to be, uh, but we all have places to grow in, and I'm grateful for that. And tonight, I just want to take just a short amount of time to give you, um, I think, a key principle when it comes to marriage specifically from the Word of God. And after I saw the skit tonight, I know why Pastor Celine wants to have a couple's... uh, weekend and, and uh, family weekend. you got problems here, brother. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. All right. So the fact is, um, God has given us marriage as a designed program that he designed. How many of you are familiar with that? Good. Marriage is God's plan. Do you know that tonight? Okay, it's not man's plan, so man doesn't get to change it. I'm sure you've heard preaching about this already, but we don't get to define what marriage is because God did that, and we don't get to decide what we want to marry and what we don't want to marry. God designed marriage to be between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, and that's his design. Now, it's no wonder to me that the world is really, I guess the word is disillusioned with marriage as a whole. Do you realize that marriage is on the decline in our culture? And the reason is, is because people see that marriage done without God or just by themselves is a hopeless situation. It really isn't great. They, they have a little bit of fun for a little bit of time and they have feelings for each other. And then when those feelings die down or there's some real tragedy that comes along in their lives, well, then they decide marriage isn't worth it. Or they've seen that marriage didn't work with their parents, and so they decide, what's the use? I can have all the privileges of marriage without the commitment of marriage, and I'm just going to be free and live my life. And I'll tell you tonight, they've come to the right conclusion. Marriage lived without God really is not a good situation. God designed it, so he's the one that tells us how to make it work. 
And I'm thankful tonight that we can have the biblical truths tonight about what marriage is. If I could just title my thoughts tonight very briefly, it's how can we build a strong marriage? And what I mean by strong is, I mean something that can weather the life trials and the difficulties that come. We were joking around with a skit, you know, and how much difficulty and trials and all the things that come along with that. Can I tell you tonight, every marriage experiences difficulty. Every marriage has difficult times and ups and downs. And so it's not a matter of, I just want to be happy. I don't want to ever have any problems. If you do that, you're not, you're not looking down the right path. Marriage is difficult, but there's nothing more rewarding. And tonight, I believe that God can help us to understand what a true strong marriage is. And I hope just in these few moments that we will be able to understand a little bit more of what God wants us to learn concerning marriage. So my question to you tonight is simply this. What is God's grand design for marriage? Why? Well, I think there's three answers to that. The Bible tells us, number one, Obviously, God brought Adam and Eve together, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, right? And replenish the earth. So there's obviously a, an aspect of childbearing when it comes to marriage. And by the way, that's a wonderful truth. Amen. And I'm thankful for children, aren't you? Amen. And I'm grateful that God gives us children. By the way, the Bible tells us that children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. I'm grateful for children tonight. That's wonderful. Number one, plan marriage. Number two, I think for pleasure, for enjoyment. God looked at Adam and Eve. Excuse me, he looked at Adam in the garden. And remember what he said about that poor guy? It's not good for him to be alone. Yes. Now, I don't know what he saw. Obviously, Adam had everything there. Matter of fact, my son actually brought this up to me. I never thought about this. But he, he said, Dad, I was thinking about this. Adam had perfect relationship with God in the Garden of Eden. And it was in that perfect relationship that God looked at him and said, it's not good for him to be alone. Isn't that interesting? God designed for man and wife to complement each other and to enjoy. I believe that's part of, the, part of the reason why God wants us to be married. But there's a third reason tonight that I want to speak on that I believe is really the key for us all to understand about our marriages. Now, you understand tonight... An unsaved person, somebody who doesn't know the Lord, can get married, they can have children, and they can even find some companionship in that marriage. You would agree with me on that. That's something anybody can do. With a little effort and a little bit of principle, they could do that. But this third one, I believe, is unique to Christian marriages. And I mean by that, marriages where God is at the center. And where there is, there is a, a desire to be biblical in the marriage. And that's reserved for those, I believe, that number one, know the Lord and that desire to keep Christ as the center of their marriage. So <clears throat> those things are wonderful and those things are good and I think they're part of God's plan, but this is truly unique. It's a distinctive of, I believe, godly Christian marriages. Can I give you what that is tonight? And that is what I believe the Bible talks about being one flesh, being unified together. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. The last art, uh, thing that I, I, I dealt with here about being unified is really the key. And here's what I want to say. When God takes two people that are individuals and puts them together, he says that the man should leave his father and his mother and they too should be, tell, say it with me tonight, one flesh. Now, that is speaking, I think, specifically of the idea of melding together two individuals into one entity that really are identified uniquely from either one. What the world would tell us is, hey, you know, you need to find somebody who fits your kind of pattern of compatibility, and man, that's going to be the key to success for marriage. You're going to have a long marriage. Find compatibility. Can I tell you tonight, there is no really such algorithm in God's plan. Now, I'm not saying you're not compatible with your spouse. What I'm saying is God's plan is not relevant to compatibility. What I'm saying is God, in His plan, has created His principles and His wisdom to be able to take two people, even though they may be opposites in every sense of the word, and put them together as one. Now, that's amazing. And I'll tell you tonight that if the man and the woman come into marriage and say, you know what, I'm going to, I'd like to get married, it's the right thing to do, but I'm going to kind of maintain my identity, my individuality, I want to do what I want to do, you do what you want to do, there's not the oneness that God wants there to be. 
And so the uniqueness of marriage is two individuals that essentially gain a new identity serving the Lord and ultimately find greater fruitfulness and, I'm going to say, productivity in the spiritual world, what God wants as a couple than they would individually. That's what God's plan is. Now that's unique. Marriages today, people come into it and they, you know, they're signing prenuptial agreements, right? And, and they're, they're kind of coming up with these plans just in case it doesn't work. And they're coming in saying, I'll give 50%, you give 50%. And I'm saying, none of that is what God says. Marriage is a 100%, 100% endeavor. Every person gives everything that they are. When I get married, when I got married, by the way, 25 years ago, next, uh, this, this June, isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Yes, my wife is like, yes, it's amazing. So... <clears throat> When I stood on the platform 25 years ago and said, I do, to my wife, guess what? I said, I didn't say it, but what it, what, by default, I said, I don't, to everybody else. Right. And so God puts us together, and we become now, through the course of our marriage, God desires us to become one. Now, that's really the difficult thing, isn't it? Taking two individuals, making them one. Now, there can't be anybody more different than my wife and I, at least in my opinion. My wife is spontaneous. She is fun. She is hilarious. She is everything that is just, you can think of fun and whatever. And I'm just the opposite. I'm like, let's just plan. Let's go to bed at 930. Let's, you know, we're going to plan it out next year. We'll take care of it. My wife's like, let's go take our shoes off and walk through the grass and have a good time. And it's like, but don't you know there's bugs and sticks out there? <laughs> so, I mean, hear me tonight, and don't judge me on this, but there's been times my wife, we just live two doors up from our church, and she walks down and she says, come on, let's go for a walk. Well, I'm kind of busy doing something. No, come on, let's go for a walk. Get outside. Hey, take your shoes off. What? They're going to see me. Take your shoes off. Feel the grass. Let me tell you, we just couldn't be more opposite. But I'll tell you right now, what I'm learning, I haven't been perfect, but what I'm learning is God in his plan can take two people that are exact opposites or even like and make them one. That's his plan. Now, let's talk just briefly then about how God wants to, new, uh, how God wants to do that. And I believe we'll have some real encouragement from the word of God. So I find my my text tonight, Philippians chapter 2. And if you don't have your Bibles, let me just talk to you if I can about that very quickly. The Bible gives us a little glimpse into the mind of Christ when he came to this earth. The Bible says, if there be any bowels and mercies, if any comforts, and and I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but he talks about the idea of Christ coming and making himself of no reputation, taking upon him the form of a servant, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. In other words, when Jesus came, his spirit was, it's not about me. I'm emptying myself. I'm humbling myself, literally. And I mean by that, think with me tonight, and I'm not going to get doctrinal, but listen to me. Jesus, the God of eternity, put himself into a body. Now you think with me about that. He took upon him the form of a servant, that is, he put a body on. Listen, and from that moment of his birth in this world till now, Jesus has a body that he really put himself in for your sake and for mine. Because without that body, he couldn't have died on the cross, resurrected from the grave, and and been ascended to heaven, and, and given me salvation and given you salvation. He did that for you and I. And it wasn't just like, hey, come look at me, I'm doing all this. It was he slipped in, essentially, to this world. He served his generation and his people, absolutely just uh, turning everything upside down. But really, some people didn't even know who he was. What I'm saying is he made himself of no reputation, but he accomplished so much. And the mind of Christ tonight, I think, is the key to being one in marriage, to have that unity in, in marriage. Let me, so so the, the idea tonight is for us to learn how that happens. Two individuals having two different ways of thinking, different goals, different ideas. And then to add to that, they're two different genders. Do you realize how different that is? 
I mean, we are as different as men and women as night and day. I don't care what the world tells you. You can't be a man or a woman if you're not a man or a woman. <laughs> now, the fact is, by the way, I love people. We had, a, we had somebody, I couldn't discern the gender service coffee this afternoon, and I found myself realizing, you know, I could get really cynical about this, or I could say, you know what, that person needs Christ. Amen. So we treated that person with love as much as we could in that moment. Here's what I'm saying, though. God taking two genders together is an amazing thing and making them one in the Lord. Amen. Now, let me just give you then the practical truths, I think, from, from Philippians chapter 2 tonight. And if you're going to take away anything, I hope you'll take away these two or three thoughts. Number one, how do we become one in Christ? How do we build a strong marriage? And you say, Pastor, you're telling me tonight that we're going to learn how to build a strong marriage in one night. Well, I think the principles are very easy. Living them out may be difficult. But let's pray that God would help us to do that. Number one, the key, I think, of becoming one in marriage is the idea of making unity our goal. I don't know what your goal was. And contrary to what we heard up on here in the skit tonight, you know, marriage isn't a, isn't, it, you know it's not a bed of roses. Shock. No, I mean, there's no question. There's the, it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever find. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go anywhere without my wife and do anything without her because my heart and our hearts are just, we, we just love each other and I'm grateful. But our marriage has been very difficult. And I'm not, being, I'm not trying to be sensational tonight. When we got to the 10-year mark, we were in the ministry our whole marriage. Let's give a quick testimony. We got to the 10-year mark and my poor wife, we had had six kids and, and every one of them had been C-sections for her and, you know, she, she made the decision, but, but God just gave her great grace. And we were, we were young in our marriage. We started having children really quick after we got married. And, and I'm telling you what, it was very difficult. I was working at church on staff, and I was giving my whole time to that and just pouring myself into that. And poor Mrs. Royalty's at home trying to raise these kids. And finally, at 10 years, we kind of had, you know what a nose-to-nose -nose talk looks like? She, nobody was mad or yelling, but she got me on her level and put her forehead up against my forehead, figuratively speaking, and said, we need to change something because this is not going to work. And I'm telling you, it was a come to Jesus meeting. We had, I had to humble myself and realize, listen, I've got a family and I've got a wife and I've got to change my perspective on things and my priorities on things. This isn't going to work. So I'm saying tonight that I know what it's like to have difficult times. There's been times we've faced trials. I didn't know if it was going to work out. But I'm thankful today to tell you that God wants us to keep as our goal not necessarily happiness, although that's a byproduct, not necessarily fulfillment, although that's wonderful and it's there too, not necessarily, you know, just having enjoyment in life. Our goal is unity. God wants us to be one in the way that we think, and I'm talking about our direction and our goals and, and, and our philosophies and the thing that God wants us to do, be going the same direction for the Lord. The Bible tells us that First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of God, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, there's a wonderful truth there about learning to live according to knowledge with your wife, and that is the idea of oneness, understanding. A lot of people joke, a lot of guys joke about, you know, never understand women, never understand women. Listen, I understand that may be a funny joke, but the fact is God commands us to live with them according to knowledge. Learn. Someone said getting married is like going back to school. Amen. And, you know, you start off in kindergarten, you're like, eh, no problems, eh, it's lovely, eh. <laughs> And, then, and then, you're in, then you're in junior high. <laughs> Hopefully not, but you know what I'm talking about. And then you mature, and you're in high school, and then you're in college, and then you're just in grad school, and then you just keep on going, learning, learning, learning. But you mature, and it becomes sweeter. Why? Because you're learning each other. By the way, the person you got married to is not the person you're married to today, and I don't mean that in a weird way, but you both change. We, we change Physically, we change emotionally, we change in our goals and our likes and everything. Keep learning your spouse. Amen. Keep practicing and growing in that. Unity is the key. 
By the way, I'll just say this, and I've got to hurry. Unity is different than uniformity. Becoming one doesn't mean you have to I would think always the same or even do uh, uh, look the same. I don't know whatever uniformity means. There's still two people, but unity means that you're both going the same direction. That's the goal. Number one in your marriage, make unity the goal. That's the distinctive of the Christian marriage. Number two then, how do we do that? Well, number two, I believe God teaches us. Jesus Christ teaches us. Humility is our spirit. Humility is the spirit. Now, here's the key tonight. I think probably most of you know the Bible enough to know this. God gives grace to the... What was that again? If you didn't know it, let's say it just a little louder, all right? God gives grace to the humble. That's what, that's what the Bible tells us. He resisteth the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Now, we all need grace in order to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. If I'm going to have a unified marriage, if I'm going to have a marriage that glorifies the Lord and we really do have a marriage that's a little bit of heaven on earth and we have a marriage that's successful, not just surviving in this world and making it through, we made it, but thriving, then you've got to have the grace of God, which is the strength to accomplish in our lives what only God can do. Listen, there's not going to be a Christian marriage You'll have a marriage, but you're not going to have a godly Christian marriage unless you have God's grace. And you're not going to have grace unless you have the spirit of humility. God resists the proud. Now guys, I'm going to talk to you just quickly because I think pride generally creeps in the hearts of men. Not exclusively, but I think mostly. Ladies, you can be proud too, and it manifests itself in many ways. But let me tell you, pride is a relationship killer. Pride kills. I, I would almost say that if, if you could take 100 marriages and you could understand and get to the heart of why they broke up in divorce, I would guarantee probably that more than 90% of them was a direct result of pride. You say, well, it was money. No, at the heart of it was pride. They couldn't deal with it. Oh, it was, you know, incompatibility. No, the heart was pride. The, pride, the Bible says only by pride cometh contention. Listen, we could go on all night. And pride is a killer of marriages. And listen, it's a pride of Christian marriages. Excuse me, it's a killer of Christian marriages. And we need to understand tonight that pride is a thing that God hates. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto Him. A proud look. I'm saying tonight that if we're going to have a marriage that is unified, we've got to have a spirit of humility. It's a heart matter. It's an attitude. It's looking at that person that I married and said, I am completely yours. Your concerns are my priorities. Your well-being is my first responsibility. I'll tell you, you said, well, I, I'd never get anything done. You'd be amazed what you can get done when you have your marriage right. A lot of people say, well, if I spend all the time with my kids, I can't have ministry. And if I do ministry, I can't time, spend time with kids. Listen, I, and I don't know how many ministers we have here, but the fact is ministry and, and responsibilities don't conflict. When my heart is right and my home is right, my ministry will be right. And when your home is right, your life will be right. Make that a priority. Humility is the key. It's the key in our spirit. It's a state of lowliness of mind. The word there is modesty. Modesty. We use that term to describe our, our clothing. We like to be modest as Christians. Listen, modesty is a spirit. It's a heart attitude. And then what comes out of that is the way I look and the way I talk and the way that I act because that's my attitude. And I'm telling you tonight, humility is a heart attitude. And if we're going to have Christian homes that God can bless and He can pour His grace into, there has to be humility and that humility is that lowliness of mind saying, listen, I can, I, can, I can forgive easily, even though I may be angry. I can restore. Why? Because humility is the spirit. All right. I love this story of D.L. Moody. You might remember D.L. Moody's name as being a preacher of years gone by. And uh, he was having a conference for men, preachers, from the country they would come and preachers from Europe would come and he had a conference in, in Massachusetts there 
And one night, he was in his college, the dorms, where all the preachers were staying, he was walking the hallways praying for those men. And this was late at night, preparing for the next day. And he noticed that outside the, the rooms of those preachers from Europe were their shoes lined up outside. And he realized after a little bit, in Europe, they're used to, at night, the servants coming through, picking up the shoes. They take them in, they polish them real nice, and they put them outside their door the next morning. So all these preachers went to bed that night thinking their shoes were going to be polished. And when they get up, their shoes aren't going to be polished. And he mentioned it to some of his students, and they didn't do anything about it. So he just went and started picking up their shoes, took them to his room, and started polishing their shoes. And late that night, someone came by and saw his light on and knocked on the door and opened the door. And sure enough, D.L. Moody's in there polishing the shoes. Here's, he's the host of the conference. He's a world-renowned pe- preacher. And he's polishing their shoes. Didn't tell anybody. The only way we know the story is because the person that knocked on his door helped him finish and told other people what happened. The next morning, all the shoes were out nice and, and orderly. Nobody knew D.L. Moody polished their shoes. Why? Because D.L. Moody had a spirit of humility that just said, it needs to be done. And I'm saying that's that's just the spirit. Now, it will play out in however different ways. Maybe it's, hey, my wife's having a long day. I'm going to wash the dishes. Guys, no one's ever been shot by washing the dishes. (laughs) That's a fact. You could talk to the CDC and find out there is not one person that's ever been shot while they're doing the dishes. You're not going to die. Of course, I'm being funny, but the fact is, we can do things. I, whatever it is, just have a spirit of humility. All right, let me go on. Number three, then, I said number one, unity is the key. Number two, humility is the spirit. Number three, if I could say this, selflessness is the method. Now, I'm going back to Christ and I'm saying, all right, he was humble in his spirit, and so he was selfless in his service. You have to be humble in your spirit to be selfless. You know what selfless means? This self is less. I know that's deep tonight. (laughs) My self is less than my spouse. You know, if both spouses said that, it would transform a lot of marriages. It's not about what you want or what I want. Yeah, but I need me time and I deserve and I know. Listen. Do you need God's grace or not? Yeah, I know you work a long time and you're, you, know, you work hard for your family and we all need to carry our weight, but the fact is we get in, we, we start having this idea of, you know, this is my time or this is, I deserve this or whatever the case might be and you put self first and it's a relationship killer. You say, well, if I give myself to other, everything else, I'm, there's not going to be anything left. I'm going to be so exhausted. Listen, do you believe God or don't you? I'm not trying to be harsh tonight, but God says I'll give grace to the humble. Man, I'd rather have God's grace than a good night of sleep any day. I'm just saying God knows best. Let's trust Him in that. Let's be selfless. You've heard of the two men who, uh, well, they went to dinner at a restaurant, and each of them requested a filet, fish filet. And after a few minutes, the waiter came back and with their order, and the two pieces of fish, they were um, different sizes. This is a conundrum. You got a big piece and you got a small piece. Well, one of the men proceeded to serve his friend, placing the small piece on a plate and handing it across the table. And the man said, the one man said, Well, you certainly have nerve. What's troubling you? He said, What's the big deal? He said, Well, look what you've done. You've given me the little piece and kept the big one for yourself. And he said, Now, how would you have done it? And the guy said, Well, I would have given you the I would have given you the big piece. And he said, well, I was just saving you the the trouble. (laughs) A lot of times that's how we treat our spouses, right? I know you have the best for me, you know, the best intention, so I'll just take care of that myself. Well, that's just pride, isn't it? So the idea is selflessness, giving yourself completely to the others. Can I close with this last thought? Help me out tonight. First of all, what is our goal? Unity Unity as 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 a couple. This is a distinctly Christian characteristic. What is the spirit of our heart to be then? Humility. That's it. That's the key. This is the answer. So then that's lived out in what method? Selflessness. The selflessness of Christ. And if I could just close with this very simple thought, Christ is our example. You say, well, I don't know how to be a good husband. 
my dad wasn't a good dad, he wasn't a good husband, I didn't know my dad, or whatever the case might be, or, you know, whatever it might be, I don't know how to be a good wife or good, a good um, mother, I don't understand how to do all that. Listen, you have the best example that any person could have, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what, if we just take a little bit of time and study how he responded to people, how he dealt with problems, how he took pressures, how he dealt with stress, how, how, he, how he handled these things, have you studied that at all? Do you know what Jesus would do? And if you do, you study that, he's our example, and you'll find selflessness was his method, humility was his spirit, unity was his goal, because that's why he came. And so I'm just saying tonight, if we want to have a strong marriage... We've got to have the spirit of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Church, it doesn't matter if you've been saved for 35 years or 40 years or three years or three months. What matters is, are you following the example of Christ in your marriage relationship? That's the key. And I believe God wants to do great things if he would just say, listen, I want to have the spirit that Christ had when he came. And I want to have that same spirit. I want to show that. It's a distinct privilege to be able to show that to my wife or my husband. That's a privilege. And if we would just get a hold of that and by faith say, Lord, I want to do that, I think God could do great things in our lives. Let me close with this example. Example is a powerful thing. Back in World War II, there, were, there was a battle. The, the bridge over Kwai in, in Japan uh, there was a Japanese prison camp, and in that prison camp, there were many different soldiers from different countries. And there were soldiers uh, from Australia and America and, and Britain and others, and it was just it was an amazing story. But there was one in particular, a, a soldier from Scotland. His name was Angus McGillivray. Now, Angus was a huge guy, just a big old beast of a guy. If you think of a soldier, you think of Angus. And the Scottish military worked in such a way that they each had a buddy, and that buddy, they called them muckers, that's just what they called them. And each soldier had a mucker, they had a buddy that was their buddy, and they were responsible for that. If, if they had any say in the matter, that guy was not going to die in this war. And this guy was not going to die in the war, they were looking out for each other. And that was ingrained in them through camp and training and all the things. Well, these two guys, Angus and his mucker, were captured together. And it just so happened in this camp that the situation was awful. I mean, people were dying and starving, and it was just awful, awful, as you can imagine. And, and it just turned into this kind of survival of the fittest. And everybody was stealing everybody else's stuff, even Americans from other Americans. And, they just, you know, they would steal food and all the stuff. Well... Angus's mucker was really, really sick and difficult. I'm mean, just was about to die. He already had his blanket stolen and he was already weak, so his food got stolen. Everybody just kind of gave him up for dead. Well, Angus said, if he one day he just woke up and said, I'm not going to let my buddy die. And so he purposed, I'm going to give him my stuff. He didn't tell anybody, but he gave him his blanket. And the 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 but he said, where'd you get this? You know, there's, he says, I came across an extra one. And then he gave him his food, and he said he got extra food, and he just gave him everything that he had, just kept giving and giving and giving. And you know what? Amazing things started happening. Angus's mucker started getting better. As a matter of fact, he got stronger and stronger and stronger. And then one day, Angus just fell over dead. And everybody was like, I can't, I, what happened? I mean, the last person we'd ever think to die was Angus. And then they begin to find out that Angus was giving all of his stuff to his, his buddy and just completely giving everything, even to the point where the doctor said he died because of hypothermia and starvation. He killed himself for his mucker. Now, something amazing happened in that prison camp after Angus died. The whole spirit of that began to change. You could read about this in the history books. It's unbelievable. The camp went from being a dog-eat-dog -dog mentality to now people giving and sharing and, and doing things for each other, so much so that they began even making musical instruments, people who had that skill. They had some people who would, um, th that could do crafts. They had some people who could do architecture, you know, building and all this. Matter of fact, they started a church there. It's called the Church Without Walls. And it was so meaningful and powerful that even some of the Japanese prison guards would come to church to watch these prisoners worship the Lord. 
The whole spirit of that camp changed because of one person's sacrificial, selfless spirit in helping his buddy out. Now that's not sensational. That's exactly what God says will happen when we put others first. So tonight, if I could say Jesus came and completely gave himself to the world, right? I mean, he gave himself completely, even to the point of death, Philippians tells us. And then that changed everything for people who believe and follow him. Imagine what your example of selflessness and humility would do in your marriage if you just get a hold of the the Spirit of Christ. Now, it takes time, but it works. God's Word is true. So if we're going to have a strong marriage tonight, here's the key. Of course, unity is our goal. Humility is the Spirit. Selflessness is how we live that out. That's the method. And Christ is the example that we can look to for every situation. Would you just purpose to say, Pastor, that seems, man, that seems kind of shallow. It seems kind of easy. It really isn't complicated. But you've got to practice it. And I think if we do, God really does have something special in store. Can we purpose to do that tonight? And I believe God will be glorified in it all. Can we bow in a word of prayer as we close tonight? Lord, I thank you tonight for your example of truth. Lord, I pray that you would help us as your people and as husbands and wives. Lord, in a world where marriage is marginalized and family is mocked, and the strength of family is being questioned and redefined, and, and in every way, it's, it's, Lord, failing in the world's eyes. They need to see not just a marriage that is together or surviving, but, Lord, they need to see true victory. And that can only come as our hearts are really in tune with what you want. Lord, I pray that you would begin tonight a work in each heart as we decide to follow you and as we decide to trust you, in our marriages. Lord, there are many, many different solutions that are promoted, but Lord, the very simple truth is that humility brings grace and selflessness, Lord, I think changes the spirit of our marriage. Help us, I pray, Lord, in this very simple truth that you would, Lord, just maybe there would be a couple here tonight that would say, you know what, we're going to take this seriously. We want to grow in this. May, may the transformation be dramatic, I pray. We thank you for your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I am so glad my wife was here to hear that. <laughs> that was a blessing. Thank you, Brother Royalty. Praise the Lord. Um, it really is a blessing to have them with us. I know it may sometimes seem glamorous to be the, that traveling family coming in, and they have four children with them, and they're uh, playing over at Southeast tonight at their youth group, but... Um, to come in, it takes a lot of work to travel, to make sure all your bases are covered back home, and to, um, I mean, we have six messages prepared, his wife, uh, several messages. That's, that's, that's a lot of work, and I guarantee they'll be tired on Sunday night, but I'm, I'm grateful to have them here. That was a blessing, great message. I do want to thank, uh, thank Mrs. Dreheim for your help your assistance to my wife, you're a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for your help tonight. And Megan, uh, doing a great job to help provide atmosphere tonight. Um, what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to stop for a second and uh, don't run away. I need to meet real quick with uh, Miss Jessica and Miss Becky down here. If you could just come up here and then uh, just talk amongst yourself for a minute. There is a lot of food still left. Grab something to eat. I'm going to come back up here in just a minute to give a few instructions. Um, if you need to take off, of course, go ahead. If you're older, I don't expect you to do manual labor tonight. But uh, anyway, uh, you're dismissed just for a moment.